Welcome to this event. It is an event that desires to present a book, one of the newest that addresses the balance all of us need for our universe, for our globe, and for humanity. The title of this book is Glow Balance. You might as well say Global on Say. Glow Balance focuses on being one of the foundational works on ethics handbook that will help us in a post-COVID world to find the balance the world needs. Um, this book has just been published this August by GlobeEthics.net, the largest digital publishing company on ethics in the world. The book focuses on global polarizations and how to deal with the opposites, the values that are necessary, and applying them into action. It has eight chapters. Without taking too much of your time, I will once again welcome all the panelists who are presenting one portion or the other of the book. If you will switch off your micros if you are not speaking, but you can leave it on if you are, there was no distraction. And um, if you would um, take note that the time allotted to you is very clear. Um, Christoph, you will be speaking immediately. I finish this short introduction to all those you have invited um, introducing your work, giving us some insight, and we want once again to thank you and thank all those who have come from around the world for this presentation. I'll be introducing the speakers even before they speak one by one. Welcome, Professor Dr. Dr. Hase Christoph Stuckelberger, President Globe Ethics Net, professor in over five, six universities currently in China, in Russia, in Nigeria, and so on in the UK, as well as the president of many other foundations, a man whose entire life shows on his white beards, knowledge, wisdom, hard work, and network. Christoph, over to you. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's my honor that you uh, participate here and a special welcome to the board, uh, the panelists, because uh, you have been along on my way and it's in a way even a joint publication because we learned a lot from all of you and uh, this uh, book should reflect and bring to a point the diversity in the unity of our humanity. That is the beauty and uh, my conviction. And let me uh, share a few slides um, in order to introduce. Um, the book was started uh, three years ago already, but then was on hold. But uh, thanks to COVID uh, lockdown, uh, it allowed to reflect and even reflect a bit sharper because to be honest, I think such a lockdown leads to some fundamental questions about life and death and what we are on earth and what is our goal on earth as, uh, as um, community. Now, let me share uh, the slides. Um, hope, can you see them? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is the book title and you can download it for free as you have seen and we'll see uh, from our website, but you can also order it uh, in print copy uh, um, on Amazon uh, through our website or directly. Um, I'd like to start with a deep conviction uh, of my life. Uh, life and also the word, there is this famous uh, Greek word from uh, the philosopher Heraclit, pantare, everything flows. That means our life is in constant move. And that is demanding. And um, I am attracted, especially in the last years, by two types of animals, the fishes and the birds. And if I look at fishes, how they are able in water, which is constantly on the move, to to find orientation and to live since millions of years. 
and the birds, when we see the storm, and they move in the air with the wind, and they can uh, do their work as they should uh, in the constant move of the air. So this is an example for that, and that based on that conviction, I come to the conclusion or to the thesis that balancing life and balancing all these movements, if everything is always on the move, with how can we find the right balance in our own life, but also in the world, a balanced world, not only individuals. And you see on that, it's a tricky balance because if one of these two persons is moving, the other has no choice than also to move in order to keep the balance. So we are independent, interdependent. We cannot, we are not isolated and one can fall when the other falls or moves. And that is the, the topic of my book. Now, in current world, I'm very much concerned about polarization. It's not only the, the China, um, uh, U.S. or the U.S.-China, uh, very serious conflict and polarization. We see polarization in, pola uh, in populism in many things. And uh, to summarize, I think there are three main world lenses or views, like uh, glasses. Uh, the black one, my power first. All is about my power what serves my power or what hinders my power. And that is the only or main uh, criteria on top of all the rest. The other is my money. Um, that is the, the yellow lens, the golden lens, so to say. Um, uh, that is my uh, ultimate criteria. But we are looking in this book, and I think all of us here together, what are our common values? And our common values first, that's the goal of Glow Balance. Uh, that would be the perspective of the, my glass. I, I try to look at the world with a lens of values, value driven, not power driven and money driven. Of course, we all need power. Of course, we all need money. But the ultimate criteria is the values. Now, if we have opposites and polarization, the power driven attitude is you or me, destruction of the enemy. Uh, uh, not two opposites can survive. I have to overthrow you. I am the superpower. I have to be stronger than you and you have to be destroyed. We have others like fusion, we merge, innovation, synthesis. I don't go through all that, but the balance is so to say the opposite to destruction. Destruction means either or, either you or me. That's the power model. Balance means not either or, but yes, both. We try to find a solution of living together where both have a win-win situation. Now that is in this list uh, you find in the book on page 76, the list uh, of what are the characteristics of low balance. And I don't read all the 13, it's explained in the book uh, more in detail, but opposites are two sides of the same coin. And then if we have two opposites, how do we balance it? We do it if we act from the center of being. Uh, I'm always impressed by dancers, for example, when I turn like this, I fall down because I get, get dizzy. But uh, a dancer is centered in the body in the middle and then the, the, the arms and the legs are free to move as long as the center is stable. So we need in global balance a, a center which is stable. I call it the center of love. It then allows us to be generous with opposites inclusive, not exclusive, values-driven, not values-denying, self-critical, not autocratic. I think one of the big reasons of this, this uh, polarization today is that, we, um, that the autocratic powers are not able for self-criticism. They just justify everything they do, but a balanced, global balance means 
the ability to be self-critical before you are able to criticize others. These are just a few of these 13 elements. Now, the core of the book is the following system. We all know have values, sustainability, freedom, solidarity, peace, and so on. And normally we have it as a hierarchy. Our top uh, uh, value is freedom or our top value is solidarity. But I put it in a circle and they say, these are all re related. We cannot isolate the values from each other. And uh, they, the, what we call relational ethics. And that leads now to screen the world when we see an opposite, we have value one and value two, and the value one can be maximized. For example, we say freedom above all, and all the rest is secondary, or we have the opposite, uh, solidarity above all, uh, or security above all, and the rest is neglected. Then we have these extremists, the extra extremes, and here the balance would mean we try to reconcile opposite values. Of course, we cannot reconcile with the non-values. Uh, terrorism is a non-value. We cannot say we find the middle way. But here we speak about values. Now, I take two examples. One is internet. For example, the free access to internet, which was the big boom in the 1990s, uh, everything open to everybody. But then, and uh, Pavan uh, from India will speak about that, we have the cybercrime problem, we have security problem, and then the pendulum goes to the other extreme, security above all, and we risk to lose freedom of internet through all measures of censorship, uh, uh, related to, um, to, to security. But the balance, how to find the balance between freedom and security, and I'm happy to have former Minister Doris Leutert here who is uh, famous in this field also of cyber ethics now. Uh, we will hear more from her. The, another example is education. Uh, if we say empowerment is a value in education, we want to empower young people to take their uh, uh, their, their life in their hand. But empowerment could also lead to, yeah, I empower them to be uh, egoistic. I empower them to exploit others. So how to balance empowerment and responsibility? Now, this system of balancing opposite values, I try now to translate into all the different fields of society and of life. And I just uh, show here chapter seven, which is uh, almost uh, yeah, 350 pages of the book, is uh, then in seven chapters, sub-chapters, global, the planet, technology, environment, health, economics, politics, culture, people. Uh, so we can adapt or implement, apply this system of global balance uh, to all the different sectors. So we will also make an online uh, course on that uh, so you can teach a whole semester or um, uh, a government for a whole year on uh, how to balance uh, these values. And that leads me to the last, uh, second last slide. Um, I summarized the book with something I call, I still have a dream. You know, there was somebody before me who had a dream. Um, uh, and uh, I call it, I still have a dream and it has the form of an egg. The egg we all know is the symbol of life across all cultures. And uh, it, it uh, mentions a number of topics that uh, are uh, in the book. I have a dream, superpowers cooperate, suspicion is converted to trust, Escalation is turned to de-escalation. Domination is replaced by participation. Innovation is balanced with conservation. Competition is combined with cooperation. Extremism is defeated by respect of opposites. Power and leadership are executed with integrity. The golden rule of reciprocity becomes true. Self-confidence is balanced with modesty. Soft water is stronger than hard stones, the Taoist wisdom. 
soft water, uh, freedom and justice kiss each other, a quote from the Old Testament, hate is transformed into love, death is integrated into life, love never ends. That's my dream. Thank you very much. This is great. Um, we have to really give you a clap from around the world. And Christoph, you'll be surprised to discover that people from Algeria, from Indonesia, from Switzerland, many places, from Germany, from India, from Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Africa, Bangladesh, and India, and so on, are all participating at this. And we are really very, very grateful. The next speaker will be um, Professor Dr. Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker. But before we introduce him, um, we shall um, welcome him. Um, but we ask now first, before Professor um, Doris Lloydhard, former Minister of Environment of the Government of Switzerland, to take the floor. I will want um, Professor Christoph Stuckelberger to give this lady a well-worded introduction. A few words. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, Doris Leutard is a famous figure in Switzerland and even internationally. She was from 2006 to 2018, member of the Swiss government, uh, many years as Minister of Economy, then the Minister of Environment and Transport. Uh, she was twice the president of the Swiss government. And also she is member of the Kofi Annan Foundation. And recently she is president of a new Swiss initiative for uh, a digital code or code of, uh, for the digital world. So, uh, uh, and uh, if I may add, we know each other since many years because she was also in younger age, uh, uh, years, sorry, not age, years, um, the president of the Swiss Catholic uh, um, Lenten Fund, where I was with Brett for also, she's in, in politics, in philanthropy, in uh, business in economy and environment. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Christopher. I'm sorry that I, I can't join the whole webinar, but I'm very glad that, that I can listen and uh, congratulate Christoph for his book. And that's really, I think, also at the right time when it's, it's published and we can talk about ethics, about balance. Uh, coming from Switzerland, you know, with our federalistic system, we always try to balance between different cultures, different languages in our society. So it's some of our DNA, I would say. But when I look at the planet, I think uh, we are not at all in a balanced situation. And the book gives us quite a lot of ideas and inspiration, how we could improve to uh, work together uh, for a better balanced system. Uh, for me, I was also a member now from, uh, from a high level panel on digital cooperation from the Secretary General from the UN, Mr. Gutierrez, and uh, Christoph referred to the values. Let's get the values balanced. Uh, one element I learned there in the discussions also between North and South, it's not that easy uh, that we refer to the same values, that we accept the same values and we prioritize in the same way. So I think uh, the first uh, issue will be, do we agree on all these values? Uh, uh, have we the same priorities when uh, uh, we agree on the values and how we can get them in a balanced system? One element which I learned a lot also with all these digital technologies is uh, we also have to cooperate much more than in the past. A multi-stakeholder approach is very necessary. So how can governments, science, academia, the civil society, NGOs, with all these experiences, how we can have a balanced system where people are better connected and can uh, exchange can be integrated and can participate on all these debates and developments. And you know, governments normally, nations, they like to decide the government is the boss. And in a more integrated system, they have to give up some power. They have to accept others with their experience, give them a position, and that's very difficult. 
And I think with these digital technologies, we have a unique chance that it's possible, like with Zoom today, uh, all over the planet together. Uh, we must also think, how is this possible in a new architecture, uh, which leads to more balance, leads to more cooperation, but at the end of the day, somebody must decide. Somebody, somebody must take over responsibility. And that's for perhaps another thing we have to exchange. Uh, cooperation is very necessary, is very uh, powerful, but at, at the end of the day, to get a balanced system, somebody must decide. And, and somebody must take over, okay, with this decision, that's it, we go together, we stick together, uh, otherwise the balance will never come. And this is something I, I think is also very difficult, but it's the only way uh, to convince people and th that they also accept the values or uh, this discussion about uh, how to put them in a balanced system that uh, they accept that they integrate also a little bit these values and a new balanced system. For the moment, I'm more, I think I, I, I see a lot of difficulties because a lot of powerful men uh, are not looking for balance. They are looking for more power. They are even looking for war. And uh, this is something which is a little bit frustrated. At the other end of the day, we see also, like yet to gain in Mali or in Belarus, movements from people who don't accept anymore that we have dictators, autocrats, they are looking for balance and they are looking for peace. And I think that's also an opportunity we should use. And therefore the book comes at the right moment to give us inspiration and perhaps also guidelines how we can use this frustration also from many people all over the world who would like to live together globally, peacefully, with all these different ethnies we are, with all these different starting points points we have all over the world. But at the end of the day, people would like to have a home, family, peace, a salary or an income that they can survive and have a decent life. And actually that's a basic value which is worth to fight for, which is worth to work for. And I'm very grateful that I can give a little help and perhaps find some elements where I can contribute to this wonderful uh, globe balance book and movement. Thank you so much to everybody and have a nice day. Um, Doris Lloydhead, we will really appreciate your speech and which has been very, very clear because your intervention was the role of bridge builders like Switzerland in promoting a balanced world. And you have singled out four items. One is we have to agree on the values, first of all, and prioritize them. Secondly, we need to cooperate, and that has to be at all levels, which means multicultural, multi, multi um, bridge building, and so at many levels. And thirdly, somebody must take responsibility. You must have to act. And finally, there is the problem of people who want more power, who want to do war, but all these problems are chances as opportunity for us. Yes. Um, in which case, uh, it's an opportunity to inspire the book is an opportunity, the guide is an inspiration. And you would, and I'm very grateful that you say that, you would, you've been leading the greatest um, Catholic organization in Switzerland, Fast and Opfa, which builds bridges around the world. You are giving yourself as somebody who is an ambassador for Glow Balance. <laughs> I want to thank you very, very much thank you so for much. your intervention. And um, I would like immediately to introduce a gentleman who, is a personality known globally. When you hear about the Club of Rome, um, which is far back in the 1960s with the limits for growth, made the epochal dimension of trying to open up the world for the things that we are discussing today, vision. Um, Professor Dr. Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker, a past president of the Club of Rome, an author of the book, which Club of Rome owns, come on, come on, let's move on, let's change. And in the current book, a uh, handbook, you, Professor Ernst von Weisecker, you've written 
even the preface, the introduction to the book. And we are glad that you are joining all the way from Germany, where you have been a parliamentarian in government. May we ask you to bring in the German discipline of Emmanuel Kant, which looks at time, seven minutes max, seven minutes to address the topic of um, global lands. Come on, let's build coalitions and networks. Thank you very much, Oviora. That is really very good. I mean, in the presence of Christoph and uh, Doris Leuthard, I'm tempted to speak Swiss German, but I restrict myself to just saying Grüezi miteinander. Um, so, anyway, as you rightly say, Oviora, the Club of Rome has the ambition since 50 years or more in looking at the limits to growth and the need for a healthy world. And of course, presently, we are very much in an unbalanced world between North and South, you know that, between rich and poor, between influential and far away from power, etc., etc. And most of those imbalances are a disaster for the losers. So we need to find a new civilization, if, if you wish, for a balanced world. And Christoph Stuttelberger has really written that in a masterful way. In my little preface, I'm saying it's a titanic work. So thank you very much, Christoph, for having done it. Well, what can we do? You know, when I was member of parliament and I was chairman of the globalization committee, we found out that the term globalization and the ruthless way of globalized financialization started in 1990, not a year earlier. Why? The reason is tragic and simple. Until 1990, we had the East-West conflict, and that, oddly, was also a balance. Capitalism was forced to show its benign side. In German, we say soziale Marktwirtschaft, socially balanced capitalism. But when communism was gone, the rich, the capital owners, etc., said, oh, why should we care about the state? Why should we care about equity, etc.? Uh, profits is the only um, thing we are really interested in. And that is globalization. So this is one example of the injustice of imbalance. Well, in that book, which you kindly mentioned, come on, we say we cannot get it cheaper than developing a new enlightenment. The old enlightenment was very good for the 18th century, you know, with Immanuel Kant and all that. But it became essentially utilitarian, rationalistic, and in favor of the efficient and to the disadvantage of the less. So, we now say in our book, well, let me briefly show the architecture in three uh, pieces of our book. The first one is, come on, don't tell me the current trends are sustainable. They are not. Part two says, come on, don't stick to outdated philosophies because they're outdated. And the third part then is, come on, join us on an exciting journey towards a sustainable world. And there we go into politics and say what we can do. Because today it's not good enough. And then on the enlightenment side, we say it will be necessary to find a new civilization essentially built on balance between short term and long term. Today's politics is essentially short term, but climate is long term. And we can't have a good climate policy if we think only short term or between 
female and male. You know, everybody knows that the dominance of males has been a disaster for much of civilization. Or between private wealth and public uh, wealth. You know, our, all our infrastructure, our education, our police, etc. this is all public. But today's dogmatic capitalism thinks only of private goods. And this is wrong. It has to be redressed. There is a dozen or more such examples of balance that we have to aim at. And it seems that with the help of Christoph Strickelberger and politicians who take these challenges serious, we can come up with a balanced world, sustainable world, and with political instruments in agriculture, in finance, in uh, industry, in infrastructure, in education, in science, etc., which allows future generations to prosper and to be happy and balanced with each other. Thank you. And um, it's unbelievable that you just did the stop on seven minutes exact. Okay. So we, we have to recognize and appreciate you, um, Professor Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker. He is my leader at the Club of Rome where I'm a member. There's a panelist here also, okay. Mariana, who is very active along these lines. We shall be coming to you very soon. But very shortly for all our participants, I've seen already some people from Ghana, some from Kenya, some from like the other countries. I've even seen that the former president of globeethics.net Walter Fust, who has been a minister of the Swiss government, is also um, here. Willy Cavol, who is a financial advisor from Germany, he's also amongst us. Hundreds of people are listening to you. And there is already a question whether we can infuse the concept of what you've said, both of you, Christoph, um, and the lady, um, Doris, and even you, um, Ulrich, whether we can infuse this concept into our leaders everywhere. So someone has to start thinking about an answer. And there's already, already, already another question. Can the UN take up this concept as they took the SDGs and make, and make global balance a, a key work to spread everywhere? And um, so, Christoph, you see um, that that might be a question that will go to you eventually or to one other of the panelists. But I have the pleasure to really thank Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker pushing us to come on on three levels. Come on and forget the old philosophies. Come on and join us. And come on and see that the current trends are not sustainable. We are coming on with you. And we can do it because the new enlightenment is the way to go. And this new enlightenment is around values, around global balance. This brings me now to China. We are going to China. <clears throat> and there we have a gentleman, Professor Dr. Liu Baocheng, who is advisor to the Chinese delegation of trade negotiations with the United States of America. And um, Liu will be addressing a question along these lines. Are there solutions for global balance in US-China relations? Um, welcome, Liu, and you have seven minutes like the rest. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for uh, all the uh, great inspirations from the previous speakers. Now, uh, with the uh, global balance, uh, that is also a, a great source for inspiration. And uh, the uh, Dr. Uh, Stuckelberger particularly mentioned about the rivalry between uh, the uh, existing superpowers, and he also traced into the historical competition between nations, uh, which is uh, uh, very instructive. And now, I would like to talk about the uh, China and the US as uh, uh, described the big superpowers rivalry, uh, which is now having a huge and also uh, escalating impact on the world economy and also on the world perception towards the value. Now, if we look at today's world, we have enough food uh, to eat. We have now enough energy. Now energy even went to negative prices. So what people are really worrying about uh, now 
people are worried about. One is that we have too much nuclear power to destroy, uh, to destroy this planet uh, numerous times. People are worried about there is uh, uh, unchecked greed for power to dominate and to dictate. And then there is also a worry that uh, the uh, global order is now tilting more and more to injustice and to uh, polarization. So this one is reflected across the Pacific. Now, the basic bone of contention between China and the US lies in on a superficial level. One is that the imbalance of trade. The uh, trade imbalance now amounts as much as uh, to uh, uh, 300 billion US dollars. So it seems that the US has been suffering and uh, uh, the allegedly victim. And on the second level, it is the forced technological transfer uh, by Chinese policy, where uh, joint ventures is required for the US firms to, uh, to surrender its technology through this joint venture. And uh, the third one would be the irreciprocal, uh, the uh, investment policy for uh, US investors. So now let's you know, uh, discuss the deeper reason behind it. One is that uh, the US has been suffering trade deficit anyway from any other country, if not China. So over my research over the past 30 years, China has been competing with more of its neighbors for the US market share. So if you look at the total trade between US and all other Asian <coughs> countries, so the trade imbalance is almost the same. So which means China is not really stealing the US, uh, the uh, market share is China is providing cheaper and reasonable quality, which is more competitive and receptive by US uh, consumers in the end. So the, right now, the, the biggest issue is that US is unhappy with themselves for, uh, since the end of the last century because primarily the, the hollowing out of its manufacturing industry. Now what is left in the US? It is Wall Street, it is Hollywood, and it's Silicon Valley. So the, the Rust Belt is now producing the big, biggest discontent and so therefore, from the previous government and now to Donald Trump, they wanted to reindustrialize the US, but is it possible? When people uh, say, uh, said farewell for, for decades to, uh, to manual work, can people be able to, to be ready? They can complain, but uh, uh, for, for the loss of those jobs, but uh, will they be ready to accept job and with the competitive uh, the labor price? So that's one big question. The other is that the U.S. are continued, uh, you know, suffering and deepening the trade deficit. But why are they able to continue to buy on trade deficit? So there must be a way that they earn money through investment uh, overseas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, in terms of the forced technology transfer, and uh, there is a narrative issue here. So who is really forcing them? So it's a term like, you know, if you want to really marry into my family, you got to deliver a baby. So, you know, it, agree or not, you know, uh, if you just, you know, come here to spend one night with my daughter, I won't uh, allow you uh, to, to step into my house. So is that something forced? So it's a voluntary choice. And both European and US investors choose to marry in China not only because of the cheaper labor, but also because the humongous amount of consumer, uh, the consumption power. So therefore they are willing to offer their technology to work with China and also they can recycle their technology because most of the technologies through my research are really nearly off shelf. So they can really revive their production life cycle by you know, computing those uh, almost outdated technology into equity value in a joint venture. So I used to lead a US biotech firm for, for 10 years. 
And we really begged Chinese companies to do joint venture so that we will not contribute cash and we contribute the technology so, uh, so we save money for the uh, R&D. And the other way is the investment environment. It is true that China is still labeled as a developing country and it is also permitted by the WTO rules that China will you know, have a certain period of time to translate uh, into a full market economy. So uh, right now the, uh, the US is getting more and more impatient about that. Actually, they are not really interested in doing manufacturing work in China. They are the Chinese financial market so they can sell more derivatives so that they can outsmart uh, many of the Chinese people. So that's something that uh, the government is uh, rather careful. And uh, because China sees itself, the, 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 the ballast uh, for Chinese economy is still the manufacturing instead of running a casino monetary game. And so it is really those Wall Street, Wall Street people who are really pushing the White House and the USTR to penetrate in uh, China for hot money circulation. So that's something we have a good reason to guard against. And yes, we made some prime, uh, concessions, but uh, that's, that has to be on a cautious move. And the other issue is the, the CCDD trap. So the CCDD trap says, okay, the, the rising second will rival with the, uh, uh, with the entrenched first. So there's a sense of fear. The, uh, this is something I give a lot more credit to the US. They always have a sense of fear. And uh, as, as recently as the end of last century, they feared the, uh, the Japan. Uh, who might buy the world and might buy Rockefeller Center and even the White House real estate, etc. And then uh, now it is China's turn to really to get worried about. They would expect China to go for a full market economy, remove the political, uh, the, you know, the Communist Party leadership, and also with the full uh, uh, dogmatic uh, capitalism uh, with the growing middle class and then there is definitely a natural demand for democracy. But now they are not only disappointed, but they are rather outraged and seeing that, well, actually the economic might actually entrenches the Chinese uh, unique uh, political regime, which is really something uh, they cannot really bear with. And so therefore, uh, you know, from trade war uh, into technology war, now even into ideological war, uh, when China, uh, you know, the, uh, when China's Confucius Institute are being obstructed, although Confucius Institute was just there to teach Ni Hao and uh, goodbye and things like that. And there is no really ideological infusion over there. So now uh, on the China side, uh, well, uh, China actually had no history of invading into other territories even during the uh, imperial time, actually Chinese hands were invaded and conquered by the uh, Normans from the north. And so the, uh, and the Xi Jinping has its two dreams. One dream is to uh, rejuvenate China. So therefore this year is the final year for him to lift the, uh, the rest of uh, uh, 70 million people out of the poverty line. And that's a shared dream among Chinese people. And then he also has another dream to build a community of shared future by uh, the uh, respecting differences and also uh, providing the means for connectivity so that uh, prosperity can be realized uh, while you know, the political system, the cultural uh, uh, conventions can be respected, et cetera. So which I really strongly endorse that. But the, you know, uh, one major challenge from China, which really I'm not happy is that, okay, when China grows too fast, there are a number of intellectuals who really are boasting too much and they talk about wolf warrior diplomacy and uh, they, they, they invite 
uh, the princes from the West by setting medical teams and protective stuff, etc. So this is something that's, that's very cheap, but that's not the mainstream of Chinese culture. And now uh, it is really time, and it's all also a, a time for critical, uh, for critical test. The, eventually, all the rival between uh, superpowers is really the rival of value. And we, in Chinese proverb, we say, those who get the way, meaning justice, will have the full support. And those who can distort the injustice, however powerful you are, you will be overpowered by people. Thank so you. now let's put the China-US relationship into the final test. And let's go for real balance globally. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very, very much, Liu. In very few words, well, you took more than seven minutes, but you have, um, you know, Chinese time is a little bit um, plus two. The hours are also plus one or plus two. But you, you, <laughs> you, you hit a nail at the head and there are so many questions for you already. I mean, when, I mean, your first key point is, you know what, much of this entire misunderstanding is superficial. And at right. the end, of course, you say much of this also is about values. And then you key into what the other speakers have said, the complex issues of the world and, you know, trying to link it up, of course, that we have too much nuclear, too much greed, too much worry, too much injustice, and we have to balance them. We must thank you very, very much for giving us this perspective. There are questions for you and I'll be reading them out when it's time. And luckily, um, uh, we are also on time in terms of this discussion. I will now want to not only thank you on behalf of all the other panelists, but to invite um, the only lady, or well, not the only lady, but to invite um, Dr. Marianne Bozesan. She's the founder and CEO of Equal Capital. She's the author of Integral Investing in Munich. Um, uh, I've met Maria since last year while we were at the meeting of the World Academy of Science and Arts, where both of us are members. And I remember that good flight we had, and you had been at the ITU here in Switzerland, helping us address issues of artificial intelligence. You have so many hats in entrepreneur, in economy, in technology, in education. Maria, your question for this session is global lands. Why integral investing? Um, unmute yourself. Thank you, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Obi-Ora. <laughs> Wise man. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. And it's as if uh, Christopher uh, and I had known about each other's work. Uh, I just completed my own book at the same time he did. And so in, we interview each other on uh, how to apply ethics in er early stage investing, which is, of course, as a computer scientist, my um, my area of expertise. So in, in, in chapter seven of the Global Balance book, um, Christoph Stückelberger states that according to the COVID-19 monitor of the International Labor Organization, at least 1.25 billion people um, don't have a job or lost their job through COVID-19. And that number we all know is actually increasing. So my, the question that I'd like to address within this context is how uh, do we make available the stimulus packages uh, to where it is needed um, from, a, from an ethical perspective? Uh, and how can we make sure that um, we don't, we avoid the, the crisis or the mismanagement that happened during the financial crisis? Uh, because as we all remember, uh, during the financial crisis, that didn't work properly. And um, so that's why I would like within this context to address uh, three questions. So how can those stimulus packages uh, can reach small and medium enterprises that are, as we all know, address uh, up to 90% of the all jobs worldwide and between 60 and 80% of the GDP. This is a far neglected job. So how can we then, number two, how can we take the um, ethical considerations and integrate them when money is being made available 
while keeping in mind that we still have a planetary emergency? An e extremely important question because it's currently falling through the crack right, right now. And then number three, and as a computer scientist, this is my job to keep up the challenges and the threats that are just as existential as the planetary emergency that come from AI, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and others, exponentially growing technologies, I like to call them. Uh, and so the ethical considerations that uh, Christoph Dudelbach is talking about are extremely important within these three contexts. So these are the major uh, questions uh, because uh, we have all forgotten about AI, our privacy is threatened, the data hunger is, is prevalent. And um, because of the pandemic, we have lost planetary considerations and also AI and uh, ex other existential threats. So as I said, I'm an early stage investor. I've been, uh, um, I'm a serial entrepreneur turned investor. I have uh, almost 30 years uh, expertise in this. So from my perspective, I, and I put all of this um, in more detail in my new book, uh, that's called Integral Investing. So what do we need in order to make those financials that are currently being made available uh, come to where it is needed. One, we need a scalable, a digitized and fast track program for making the money available uh, to the startup companies. Uh, number two, banks are not the right partners to do that. And we've seen that um, following the financial crisis. Why? Because banks do not have the right proper uh, qualifications nor the, the, the criteria to do the job. And so this is quite important. And, and the result, of course, is that a lot of money uh, was it's, it's not being uh, invested and and it doesn't get to the people that is needed, no matter how low the interest rates are, are going. So this is a very important aspect. Number three, those whoever, whether it's banks or whoever uh, make the decision on bringing the money to where it is needed, need better de-risking criteria. What is that? I mean, what a better de-risking criterion is that the one that takes the planet and the people into consideration. So the current for-profit only criteria need to be expanded. And of course, number four, the legislations need to support these changed criteria of success. So in order for that um, to get into place, we need standards for holistic metrics and benchmarks on what does it mean to be successful. Um, so we need to move away from for-profit only measurement criteria to include people, planet, and profit, and I dare say uh, purpose and also happiness. We need to create a well-being economy. And those measurement criteria need to be part of that in order for us to succeed. And uh, of course we need mandatory transparency and reporting. We've seen from uh, the, the scandals with BMW, Volkswagen, Daimler-Benz, and other organizations that uh, previous uh, um, uh, requirements didn't work, voluntary declarations. They have received prices for uh, sustainability and they have lied to us. So from my perspective, in order to summarize and be in time, my dear friend of Yora, I think the key to all of this is a changed mind shift. And I have a lot of faith and I know for a fact that young people already get it. So all the stuff that is currently happening is actually quite encouraging. And uh, so moving forward, I'm, um, I'm, I'm totally thrilled to be part of this movement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana. And you just spoke for four and a half minutes, not even up to five minutes. So okay. you, donated, you donated all the time back to China. And you, <laughs> you have to shake her hand properly after this meeting. And uh, I'm ready to answer any questions you may have, of course. There is already one or two, but I, I just remember that um, when we were discussing the issue of artificial intelligence, Mariana said ethics should not be saying one must, you may, you must. You have to be there in Silicon Valley at the time the technicians are developing their products. You cannot be talking about ethics or artificial intelligence when you are absent. Don't chase the wind. Thank you, Mariana, for that. And exactly what also Ulrich von Weizsäcker has been saying all the time and all the clicks. We would like to appreciate that you have seen, taking your point of view, 
integral integrality in investing that um, we need a new mind shift, a new mind shift, a new mindset, a new scalable digitalized platform. And Christoph addressed this in his book. So your book and Christoph's book sync, just like come on sinks. It looks like we should form you all into an organization of um, thinkers for the new generation. When we talk about new enlightenment, like Professor Vitek has said, those of you on the panel, we should bring you all together to be addressing the UN and other institutions. The last to speak at this panel is um, Dr. Pavan Dugal. He's a cyber law expert all the way from Delhi in India. He's also an advocate of the Supreme Court of India. Um, Pavan has just come out with a book again with Christoph on cyber ethics and cyber law. Pavan, today your friend has written a book going beyond what both of you has done and you are being invited to share your thoughts from Hindu wisdom. You know, that's what comes from that part of the world. How to reach global in polarized cyber technologies and for cyber security. Over to you, seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Viola. I thought, let me uh, share my perspectives by a short presentation where I could basically try to address these various issues. Uh, so the important issue is how to reach global ones uh, in polarized cyber technologies and for cyber security. You talked about uh, the Hindu culture. The Hindu culture has one fundamental uh, principle to rely upon. It's an ancient saying which says, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the entire world is one family. And when uh, Professor uh, Christoph Stuckelberger in his book on globalance has defined globalance to mean a global balance of values and virtues which are opposites or in tension to each other, but belong together, he's only reiterating the ground reality of what exists. Uh, what currently exists as black and white is invariably not there, but there are a lot of grays out there. In the cyber world, we are already beginning to see a new uh, ball game happening. A new cyber world is already in the process of emerging. No wonder we are beginning to find that uh, the developments during COVID-19 have led to massive changes in cyberspace. And these changes are intrinsically uh, riding along with the uh, inconsistent developments that are taking place during COVID-19. On the one hand, we have been pushed to work from home and therefore uh, video conferencing is the new normal as is the present uh, uh, webinar. On the other hand, work from home is simultaneously exposing us to large number of uh, legal policy and regulatory issues in the sense that hackers uh, have suddenly discovered that today is the golden age of cybercrime where they can attack at will, where they can steal money and data at will. No wonder when I talk of cybersecurity, I find an intrinsic contradiction. At the international level, there's no international one cybersecurity law in place. But at the same time, in the same breath, I find different countries already coming up with distinctive national laws to regulate cybersecurity at national level. And when I look at uh, the global peak ecosystem, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's Vietnam, or whether it's Australia. They're all in their own distinctive ways trying to go ahead and protect their cyber sovereignty, their cyber security by coming up with their own distinctive national legislations in this regard, which have almost all one commonality to focus on cyber resilience. Well, globalance today applies equally to cyberspace to cyber world, to artificial intelligence, cyber security, and freedom on the internet. These may all look contradictory to each other, but I think there's one common factor, which is joining all these distinctive forces, and that is cyber ethics, which joins all these technologies, and hence these have uh, cyber ethics as a direct connection as being what we call in Hindu culture as the sutradhar, the, the storyteller, who there was a common bead, the common thread amongst all distinct color beads that exist. Darknet, artificial intelligence and governance during COVID-19 uh, effectively means that there are contradictions. 
people uh, see Darknet as a place where they can go ahead and do all kinds of cyber criminal activities. At the same time, in the same breath, Darknet is an intrinsic manifestation of contradiction because it's the ultimate place to be safe uh, from surveillance, where you can go ahead and exercise your digital liberties, your freedom of speech and expression when in gay abandon without any fear from anything else. In today's COVID-19 times, while there is facial recognition all around us being uh, relied upon by state and non-state actors, at the same time, we are also having substantial growth in quantum computing, where the quantum computer promises to break all our passwords in a couple of minutes. These are intrinsic contradictions, but yet there appears to be commonality. We uh, are entitled to our free speech, our privacy in cyberspace, and yet this privacy and free speech are all getting evaporated. The new developments happening in different parts of the world are telling us that these are all transient. But the fact is, despite all that, cyberspace is a constant backbone, a central lifeline for all of us in our day-to-day -day operations. So while COVID-19 has led to almost number of contact tracing apps across the world for fighting the public health emergency, at the same time, it's also being used extensively for surveillance and monitoring of people and their data. On top of it, COVID-19 has brought forward conflict and contradictory elements, which are joining together in the fight against uh, to fight public health emergency. So fake news, which is also getting disseminated globally, is also now being used as a mechanism to even target the fighting of COVID-19. So where is the way forward? We are looking at a level of mistrust and distrust in governance of governments across the world. But then there's an equally contradictory element that the governments are here to stay. And governments are also being backed as the best horse, which is best well equipped to uh, help us sail through these choppy waters of COVID-19 and the internet. So when we do these various online courses on Cyber Law University, the focus is to bring this huge diversity of uh, uh, these thought processes during COVID-19 times and to bring to these uh, uh, more than 24,000 students of 169 countries uh, who are doing these courses that look in this contradiction, try to find some commonality. In diversity, try to find some unity. That's in a nutshell what life is uh, today. That's what life has taught us, and that's what we need to be careful of, more so in the context of this remarkable book on globalance by Professor Christoph Stackelberger. My congratulations to him, and thank you. Thank you very much, um, Pavan Dugal. This, he is also a member of the board of GlobeEthics.net, and one of the foundational members, as we've seen from his uh, very um, chairman of the commission in his country in India. And he often is here in Geneva addressing the UN and the institutions along these lines of um, this dark net people. I hope they are not black lives. You know, this dark net, you know, everything dark is always black and so on. We need to really uh, make sure that they don't become Africans. Um, and I'm happy to see Habat Makinde there all the way from Kenya. He's our executive program on, the pro on this. We've now listened to um, all the panelists. And uh, Liu, the first question is already hitting out at you. And um, just get ready, I'll just give it to you. China, no imperialism, question mark. How about Tibet? But this is now the political angle. Everything you said seems to have been accepted, except this one where you say China has not invaded any place and so on. And somebody from Germany, actually Andreas Kilvine is asking you this question. So as you take note of that, there is a question being addressed already um, uh, to Ulrich and of course to Christoph. How do we infuse the concept of globalance in our leaders everywhere? That's a very strong question. And how can the UN take um, the concept further? If you would like to address that. And there is of course a question also for you, particularly Ulrich where you say, come on, forget the old philosophies. And somebody said, we cannot forget Aristotle. And we cannot forget Jesus, who said about the golden age. I think they are taking you literally, but you must now have to say that the old philosophies, just like old men and old women, have still some value.
but I leave you to speak on that. Someone wants you to clarify whether we should throw away all the old things and where do we then end up? And that is now for Ulrich. And of course, um, there is a very important question again for Christoph, and, um, and that is also being addressed even to Marianne. Can we talk about moving from conceptualization to transformation? You know, because there is a lot of, you know, the concept of globalance and so on and so forth. How can we now make it transform it and make it real? I'm sure each and every one of you may have a word or the other to respond to these questions. Um, because we want to end in the next 25 minutes, and there are only, of, only a few of these questions, um, I do feel that you have not more than three minutes each to address it, because there will be a final speech where we wrap up the session. So Liu, China, imperialism, Tibet? Mm. Well, uh, I was talking about the Chinese hands, uh, uh, which is really the mainstay in the uh, Chinese population. Actually, uh, the mainland China was uh, actually three times conquered by the Normans in the north. And uh, the Normans, the north even conquered as far as to the Mediterranean Sea. So the, the hands, because they grow uh, more on their uh, Yangtze River and also the Yellow River, they are more uh, confined to their land and uh, also to the uh, good crops they have enjoyed. So they have less aggressive aggre uh, the uh, edge uh, yeah. towards other, uh, other nations. And uh, the fact also you can see that uh, the, uh, China discovered, uh, you know, uh, visited Africa and uh, many other places. Uh, the, uh, like 87 years ahead of Columbus discovering the uh, North America, but uh, so far uh, you do not see any uh, black friends, black bro brothers who are growing cows or you know the uh, uh, cultivating potatoes for China. So the China was not really in, in, engaged in slavery trade or colonizing uh, any part of the uh, the African uh, continent or the ASEAN continent, etc. So as for Tibet, it's, uh, uh, well, uh, depending on what type of literature you're reading, the, you know, China is really a combination of many pieces like uh, 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 Xinjiang and uh, Tibet and uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And also China lost the land on the other hand to, uh, uh, to, to much of the humiliation of the uh, last, one century to Russia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there has been quite changes. There has been uh, agreements. There has been concessions, and also there has been voluntary unity. So uh, therefore, I think this is not really a proper time to discuss into all those historical details. Uh, but the overall, I could see that China is now uh, uh, looking for a peaceful rise and also looking for a shared prosperity with the rest of the world. Thank you very much. That was very precise. And then Ulrich, we give you the floor um, with your experience, um, uh, the old philosophies one, and number two, how to move these very strong globalance ideas into action at various levels. And Christoph will also be addressing it towards the end. And you have to unmute yourself. Can, I, can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, fine, thank you. Um, I mean, all people of today have to be proud of ancient thinkers from China, from India, Jesus Christ, uh, Aristotle, etc. There is no question about that. But what was called the Enlightenment of the 16th, 17th, 18th century ended up in the dominance of utilitarianism. Everything has to be, uh, well, create additional wealth, which for a relatively small population is wonderful. 
but for 8 billion people can mean destroying the earth, period. And then we discovered, and Pavan will like to hear that, <laughs> that in the West, there is a tendency of allowing only one truth. While in the Asian cultures, you have the need for an understanding of balance. And the European enlightenment also included colonialism, you know, which was a disaster for much of the world. And even the great people like Kant and Rousseau were thinking that Europe is superior and has all rights governing the world, which of course is wrong and in many cases criminal. So we do appreciate old wisdom, but find it necessary to be more modest and more balanced. With regard to the question how such new enlightenment, more balanced, more justice oriented, etc., can be made a reality, we need to learn that dictatorship has been a wrong concept anyway. Not only Lukashenko and these guys. We have to learn that pure utilitarianism can be destructive. We have to learn that the dominance of finances, of capital, can destroy the real economy. We were learning from Herman Daly, also once a member of the Club of Rome, now an honorary member, that the um, invention by David Ricardo that trade is good for all was done under the assumption that capital would not move across borders. In his time, this was natural. But today, capital is moving at light speed through the world. And we have a calculation that 98% of the money that is running around the world is speculative. And only 2% is for paying for goods and services. This has to be redressed, reduced. So I'm not against capital, as long as Mariana Bosesan says, uh, a good kind of capital, of course, wonderful. But there have to be has to be a rule system, nationally and internationally. So essentially, we are very happy having Christoph Stückelberger telling us that also the ethical part is essential and learning from Obiora that if Europeans and other Westerners are uh, just um, dominating uh, Africa or so. This is unjust. This is not sustainable. So uh, a new kind of enlightenment is not saying no to Jesus and Aristotle, <laughs> and, uh, the Chinese uh, wise people, but is meant to integrate uh, them into a more humane and nature oriented kind of civilization. Yes, and Gilles Bach is already challenging you, Ernst. He's already saying that um, enlightenment had also some other sides that were good. Of course, you will also have to identify that. He said it was not only colonialism and um, the rest. Um, right. but, um, Marianne, there's somebody who really wants you to say something about whether the, I mean, just to pull from Christoph's work and from the work you do, how all this can be applied to personal life. I mean, the question is, how do we, as part of community, apply balance in our own daily lives of today. 
and what can be done, drawn from this book that can be applied to make our own lives successful and the SDGs successful. Seeing you as a balanced woman, happy person, smiling always, one looks at you as the best to answer this question. Would you want just to address it before we then go to Christoph, who will be addressing even a new question also that has come to, to him, but I'll announce it immediately, but Marianne first. Actually, um, Ulrich, uh, Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker has said it, and so did Christoph uh, Stückelberger. If you really take more time to speak with them, they will all tell you that it is all a function of evolution, which is actually what um, Ernst Ulrich just said. You know, it's evolution. We have to grow to a certain level of understanding and mindset uh, in order to be able to um, address the issues that we have. And at the time, colonialism was the right thing to do because that was the level of understanding that people had. And that's the same thing with uh, today. We have a different understanding. We see the world from a world-centric perspective. And, uh, but that every baby is born at square one and has to evolve. So some people never grow, just like Donald Trump didn't. I mean, got stuck at 12 years, or I pretend even at seven. Uh, but those of us who awaken, who evolve, who work on themselves, grow to see that we move from an egocentric, only me and mine, to an ethnocentric, make America great again, or Hungary or Poland to a world-centric perspective where the Club of Rome keeps saying, oh my God, we have a planetary emergency and we need to address it. Otherwise, we will all die. But this is a mind shift. And I am a computer scientist uh, issue. I'm a computer scientist by education, artificial intelligence. I studied artificial intelligence when most people didn't even know what computer science was. They thought it was in, in journalism. But my PhD is in psychology because I needed to understand, are we crazy or what? And so what I learned by doing this PhD work is that we all evolve. And so when it comes to question, how do we get our leaders to bring about this transformation is we need to help them shift their minds from an egocentric, ethnocentric, mind-centric point of view and only elect those who already are there because we don't have time to wait for them. We only have 10 years to implement the UN SDGs within planetary boundaries. And uh, the Potsdam Institute, for instance, and uh, the Club of Rome, Jorgen Randers and others have shown us we can't pick and choose the UN SDGs that we like. Oh, let me do this and not that at the expense of the climate. No, we need to implement them all together and set ourselves and our systems such that we are, you know, we save ourselves and we only have 10 years time to do this. Now, in terms of uh, uh, early stage investing and small and medium enterprises, you know, which have such an impact in our economy, go and read my book on integral investing. I have shown that actually you can make more money. You can be more financially successful if you integrate ethics and morals and planet and the people into your de-risking criteria. So it's, and then you could do with that money, do good, you know, give it to others who need it. Uh, so it all works together. So I'd like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well received and very helpful. Christoph, you have the floor. And unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for all the panelists for this very wonderful uh, set of flowers of uh, setting uh, different aspects in the same garden um, to, to, to flourish. Let me uh, concentrate on three short remarks. First, uh, this question of Hans Ulrich von Weizsäck, and I also quote it in the book, um, I really deeply uh, convinced that the so-called Eastern values in Asia are more inclusive than the Western one. Uh, so we can learn a lot from China, from India, from Vietnam, from many of the Asian value systems to emphasize this and and not the either or. Uh, that does not mean that in the West we have also, and I have a whole chapter where I refer to uh, 20 or so um, scholars or thinkers, philosophers from East and West who uh, emphasize that too. Uh, 
And by the way, uh, Christianity is often seen as a Western religion. And I always tell, especially in China, it's not a Western religion, it's an Asian religion. It was born in Asia, in the Middle East. And the thinking, the Hebrew Jewish Christian original thinking is not the Roman thinking, which was, uh, but the, it was much more integrated and balanced than what came out then later as uh, the Western Christianity. Uh, my second remark is on the question, can uh, UN take up the concept and how to in influence global leaders uh, for global ends and interest them? I take them together. Yes, I think it's a good uh, point and I would like to strategize. Uh, that's why I also want to make a bit more noise with that book than with others in order to really uh, stimulate the discussion. That's why I'm happy that you uh, agreed to be panelists and the participants to participate because um, I think we, we need to be more heard with this kind of approach to counterbalance the polarization trends which are so loud and so strong. And that means uh, I think we really should uh, sit together. How can we bring this uh, aspect more precisely to the UN or to other global leaders' uh, possibilities, events? I remember we had leadership uh, high-level events in China. We have uh, in New York uh, also Michael Miller, the former uh, number two in the UN and uh, number one of uh, United Nations Geneva invited me per personally to contribute in the field of UN but uh, and uh, Doris Leutert is in the high level panel so let's strategize how together I would like to get your input on that also how we can approach that on an international level G20 is another there are different fora and of course, the Club of Rome is a key, uh, key place where I'm also happy to further contribute. I uh, quote in my book that uh, my first book in 79 was very much influenced by the limits to growth of Club of Rome. So Club of Rome philosophy of global perspective is dear to me since uh, 45 years. Uh, now, the third point is about uh, co how to come from conceptualization to transformation of Ulrich Nietzsche and other, other Nietzsche and others. I think it's really important uh, key. And uh, I, if you look at my book, it's, it's, it has a, a strong conceptual part because we need to be convinced that this is not just random uh, 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 short-term idea, it is fundamentally rooted in uh, philosophy of thousands of years and in the thinking. So it has a found, strong foundation. But then we cannot uh, stop at conceptualization. That's why, especially in chapter seven, I come to, in each of the 30 uh, sub-chapters, I come with a very concrete uh, recommendations, is it on education, on media, on agriculture, on urbanization, on uh, name it. Um, so uh, this could be a whole program of implementation and I'm convinced that the financial sector is a key driver. That's why I'm involved now in impact investing and uh, the second key driver is education. That's why Globe Ethics Net has this focus on ethics in higher education. So these are, among others, key drivers. But behind that, let me close with one remark on the last chapter eight, uh, death, life, and love. If we look at what happens in Belarus and other parts of the world, I must say, I'm not sure if I had the courage of the people there, because you never know if tomorrow the uh, the, the military is coming there and put an end with respective uh, uh, victims. But it shows that there is a, a point in life where we lose fear because it is such a misery that nothing can be worse than where we are in. And I think this fear, to lose this fear only when we are really at the, at the lowest point of existence, 
uh, close to suicide or close to depression or close to burnout, that's not the best way to wait until we are there. So how to overcome fear is a key issue. And uh, if we want to go to that point, I think the last chapter eight aims at that. And that's why I also say also in my egg, uh, I have a dream, uh, integrate death into life. We need a new relationship to death. That means if we f lose the fear for death, it may give us the energy for the transformation which is needed. Because only if we are fearless, we can do the transformation. And many people uh, have not the energy, and I don't criticize them, have not the energy to be transformative because they always care about their lives. Uh, if I take the big uh, uh, spiritual leaders in the world, is it Gandhi, is it Jesus, is it uh, also, I mean, uh, Buddhism and, and all the others, and also political read, leaders or revolutionaries, what is common to them? All of them have lost their fear for death. They say, I fight for, I use this military word, but uh, in the peaceful way, nonviolent way, I, I, I risk my life for the common good, and uh, because I don't fear death. So, sorry, uh, it's almost a sermon now, but uh, <laughs> I think we have to talk about that too. Because uh, the, 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 the current situation is too much uh, based on fear, 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 which then increases the disaster. Thank you. We want to thank the author of this new book, Professor Dr. Christoph Stuckelberger. Um, by the way, do you know that each of you, I'm just addressing Pavan Dugal, who spoke about cyber ethics and technology. Um, Pavan, the technological tools of today's world make everybody have a copy of this book in their hands. So if you have a smartphone, like I have one here, this book is on your smartphone. You can read it there. So if you want to download the book, I saw already a question, Ulrich Nitschke, our friend from the Uni um, Center in Bonn, was already asking, you just go www.globeethics.net slash globalance. You have the book here in your telephone. You can read it there online. You can download it. And that's one of the things that Darknet cannot stop. Um, Pavan, I wanted to say that to your direction. In other words, the digital platforms are very, very helpful for our work and for the things we do also at globeethics.net. This is the largest ethical provider along the lines of ethics in higher education, for institutions, for professionals, for students, and also for teachers. And looking around the panel, um, Liu Baocheng, all the way from Beijing, joining at this time of the day. It is our actually night there. And um, I can see sleep coming on your eyes, Liu, even though you are a midnight man. That's when you have to do the negotiations with the US. Toy, 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 don't give up. Continue to tell everybody in the world that these things are really superficial. We have enough food, we have enough drinks, let's concentrate on the positive. We want to thank you for your very eloquent contributions, Liu. You are wonderful. Ernst, your wisdom, we don't know where to start to thank you for. I mean, along the lines of your entire life as politician, as classroom teacher, as author. I remember in the Wuppertaler Institute, Future, and so on, all the works you've been doing around the world. And you, uh, Ulrich, you know what Christoph said recently, you are not giving up. You are fighting beyond death. You are living above life. So you are living a life that is beyond the present because you believe in love and you believe in the good things. So you are a good example for many of us to follow. Marianne will say yes, because you are chair for the Club of Rome, where I also belong. So we cannot contradict you at all. And um, Pavan, um, we are really very, very grateful for your enlightening words. And using the platform of the slides, nobody will say they didn't understand all the points you made. And um, the dark net people have never caught me and they won't see me. Um, but I want to thank you very, very much for intervention. There was a minister who joined us at this event, um, Doris Loyhard, but she had to leave early enough. But her contributions were, let us agree on the values, first of all. Let us prioritize them. Global Lands has done it. And let's move along those lines. Um, Walter Fust, we know you are somewhere there among many others. 
um, who are there from many countries, Indonesia, Switzerland, India, China, Ethiopia, South Africa, Germany, Algeria, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, and we can continue calling all the countries where all of you come from. You are part of something new. Christoph Stuckelberger makes us think anew. Glow balance. And I put my hands like this and I find the balance. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. We are on time and the event is officially ended. Look out for the next. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you and congratulations.